My name is Victoria and together with my colleague Charlotte, we are the two regional coordinators of Euraccess Latin America and the Caribbean. Welcome to this information session on the Mariskowska Curie Actions, what's in it for mobile researchers and institutions. This information session is one of the first in the world to present the Mariskowska Curie Actions under the new EU's funding program called Horizon Europe, launched in February 2021, lasting until 2027. This session is for those interested in a research stay in Europe or in collaborating with European institutions. You will learn how you can benefit from the MSCA to carry out a PhD, a postdoctorate, or a research project with several European and international institutions. The plenary session will last one hour, after which we will split into four breakout rooms with different topics. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker who will present the MSCA under Horizon Europe. Boriana Jotova is a policy officer in the Marius Kolovska Curie Actions Unit of the Directorate General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture. She joined the European Commission in 2012 and is currently responsible for the cooperation with Latin America and the Caribbean in the MSCA team. Boriana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vicky. And first and foremost, let me welcome everyone, um, all the participants today. Thank you very much for your interest in the Boris Kudowska Q reactions. Um, in a nutshell, maybe some of you are uh, well aware of what our actions stand for, but just in a nutshell, to explain that uh, the Maris Kudowska Curie Actions uh, fund human support, human capital development through training, career development, and mobility, but also they uh, support the development of excellent doctoral programs as well as diverse, um, diverse international research and innovation co collaborations and uh, knowledge sharing and exchanges between participating institutions. My presentation today will focus on Horizon Europe. And as Vicky said, uh, this is the framework program uh, for research and innovation of the European Union for the period 2021, 2021-2027. Um, uh, the Marie Skodowska Curie Actions will remain uh, an integral part of the program and uh, remain part of the first pillar of this framework program called Excellent um, Science. Um, first, a few words about um, the, the, the overall impact of, uh, of the Marie Skodowska Curie Actions. In fact, um, our actions have a proven impact on the RNI. Um, landscape in Europe and uh, beyond. Uh, as many of you know, um, our uh, actions support uh, excellence proposals and ideas in all research domains. Um, in the next framework pro program period, we'll fund also proposals and ideas in the field of nuclear research, which was uh, not allowed uh, um, in the previous program period. And um, all these ideas and proposals are, um, um, the scope and nature of all the proposals are se selected freely in a fully bottom-up, but our, um, by our applicants. Uh, I must say also that uh, our actions are very competitive, uh, uh, which led to the introduction of some demand managements for uh, what something that I will talk about uh, a bit later today. Um, it goes uh, without saying that the Maris Kodowska Curie Actions have a very important and significant impact on the funded researchers and the RNI staff uh, on their uh, career development. Our actions, in fact, um, aim to equip researchers with, with the perfect combination and the right combination of um, transferable skills and also research and innovation related skills. Uh, but uh, and uh, Doing so, we do so through mobility. Mobility in the sense of uh, uh, mobility across borders, mobility across sectors and across disciplines. These three eyes, the three aspects of uh, mobility are very are key, are key and very important in our program. Um, last but not least, um, our actions have a very important structural impact on participating organizations. Um, what do I mean by structuring impact? Um, not only uh, our actions help spreading excellence, uh, excellent practices and the high level um, uh, practices for research and innovation um, um, and education, uh, but also uh, we, we do um, uh, help 
uh, participating organization further enhance their research capacity, um, strengthen their um, ability to attract talent to their institutions. Uh, but And last but not least, we, we help uh, boost the global reputation of institutions. Um, for all these researchers out there listening to us today, I would like to also um, uh, clearly state that our actions are open to uh, researchers from any nationality. And we do offer a very attractive uh, working and employment conditions. In the next framework period, 2021-2027, uh, our motto uh, was um, evolution, not revolution. What does it mean in practical terms? This means that we'll continue with um, many of our um, current funding modalities, but also we've, we use this opportunity to improve uh, and um, slightly simplify uh, the rules uh, in view of the input that we got from our stakeholders. Uh, starting from, from the names of the actions, uh, in fact, uh, in the future we'll have a more simplified and more uh, intuitive and clear, to, especially to newcomers' names. For example, our current innovative training networks uh, action will be called uh, doctoral networks and we'll continue funding um, doctoral training for, uh, and um, uh, excellent and innovative doctoral uh, training. Um, our second main action, uh, currently called individual fellowships, will change a uh, slightly changed name to postdoctoral fellowships and will remain the key um, action for individual projects at postdoctoral level. The current very important and international actions, who I believe many of you are well aware of, the RISE action, will change name to staff exchanges and will remain uh, the action funding short-term exchanges um, of RNI staff between participating organizations from all over the world. In fact, this is maybe a very good opportunity to tell you that under Horizon 2020, in the current framework program, the RISE action and the Maurice Kudowski Security actions in general uh, are really responsible for um, more than half of all participation of non-EU country uh, per participations of institutions from non-EU countries. Moving forward to the last uh, two main actions, the co-fund actions remain as such and will remain uh, an action supporting um, new or existing uh, co-funded uh, programs for postdoctoral and doctoral uh, at postdoctoral and doctoral level. And the last action will be called MSC and Citizens. Under this umbrella, we organize the, the famous European Researchers Night, and this action will remain our main action for public outreach activities. Before moving to uh, and having a closer look um, uh, on each of the actions, I will quickly um, just flag some of the main novelties in terms of implementation. I already mentioned that we try to simplify our rules, to fine tune our definitions and to harmonize the uh, conditions that we currently have. In I'll give you just one example. What do I mean by fine tune definitions? Um, as some of you might know, currently we're using uh, terminology as uh, early stage researchers and experienced researchers. We decided to change um, um, our definitions and to rather use doctoral candidates and postdoctoral researchers in this regard and to simplify the definition of each uh, of them. So doctoral researchers will be those fellows who do not have a, a doctoral degree at the time of recruitment, while postdoctoral researchers will be the ones who actually do have a PhD degree at the relevant um, uh, reference date. In terms of harmonized conditions, I'll just quickly mention two of the important changes uh, that we decided to align across actions to make our um, actions more um, clear and um, easier to remember and the, the, the entire objective was really to, to align to the extent possible across actions our rules. Um, we'll introduce a single mobility rule, so all our actions we have one single mobility rule, uh, not two like currently. And we'll have uh, the same duration of secondments limited to one third in all of the actions. I'll show you a bit more on this later uh, today. Um, important thing, um, another important thing to highlight are, is that we have also changed some of the funding modalities. Um, we have increased many of our allowances, uh, but also we have introduced um, an important flexibility with regard to the, the so-called family allowance. In the next framework period, um, 
researchers will become eligible for this family allowance as soon as their family status changes. This is a very important change and we believe uh, that will um, many of our sta stakeholders will be happy with uh, with these developments. We have also introduced uh, new allowances um, for um, uh, in case of absences, the long-term leave allowance, which will cover additional obligations of a recruiter or of the recruiting institution in case of long-term absence of the fellow, and also the so-called special needs allowance, which is an allowance for uh, researchers with uh, disabilities and uh, aim to uh, help them um, uh, go through mobility-related um, obstacles uh, in, in their grant. Last but not least, an important policy development from for, for policy development from our side. Um, these are two important guidelines, uh, guidance documents that we developed. One on supervision will actually, which will actually include uh, good practices for both supervisors and uh, researchers, and uh, the so-called MSA Green Charter. It, uh, compilation of environmentally responsible practices. Both of uh, both documents will be, in fact, um, our uh, our applica applicants and beneficiaries will be actually encouraged to um, adopt them and to follow them on a best effort um, obligation best effort basis. And now starting um, action by action, I'll quickly show you some of the main um, novelties and uh, specificities of our action. We start with the doctoral uh, networks. As I said, this is the um, action which supports the establishment create and creation of doctoral programs, excellent doctoral programs. And the main objective is to train uh, entrepreneurial, resilient, innovative uh, doctoral candidates, uh, which are equipped with the right sets of uh, skills to challenge current and future um, um, global challenges, let's say. Um, our doctoral networks under the uh, doctoral networks pro projects, um, consortia could actually choose to, um, uh, to implement an industrial doctorate or a joint doctorate. Um, in, under the industrial doctorates, um, the recruited doctoral candidates, in fact, um, spend uh, at least 50% of their time in the industry or, uh, or an SME, for example. Um, while the joint doctorates are a more uh, specialized form of joint collaboration where the ob overall objective is um, to uh, award a joint doctoral, um, a joint double or multiple doctoral degree. Um, on the screen you see every time there is a novelty I've put um, a small uh, disclaimer that this is a novelty. One novelty with regard to the joint uh, doctorate is in fact the, the um, requirement to um, to uh, have a pre-agreement in the proposal. So institutions who do want to implement this form of doctoral networks would have to, um, um, will have to present um, an evidence for a pre-agreement for the establishment of this uh, joint double or multiple degrees. Um, important uh, thing for all the uh, important aspects to be highlighted to all researchers listening to us today is that the applicants for these uh, specific schemes are not the doctoral candidates themselves, but actually these are institutions, consortia of institutions. Um, as I already mentioned, um, these institutions could be higher education establishments, uh, research institutions, research uh, infrastructures, but also businesses, industry, SMEs, um, also uh, public bodies, um, and national administrations, and civil society organizations, for example, also NGOs. So uh, we do, um, consortia could be composed of a variety of um, organizations. We have three uh, minimum requirements for the participation of these actions uh, and um, you'll see them below on your screen. Uh, we require at least three independent institutions established in different EU member state or Horizon Europe uh, associated countries. Minimum one of these three must come from a new member state. Beyond this minimum requirement, institutions from any sector, academic or non-academic, could actually um, Really joined uh, the the consortia and um, take part of uh, of these doctoral networks. Quickly, a few words about the overall size and duration of the doctoral networks. Um, the current rule is that they will be um, limited to up to 360 person months for the standard doctoral. Um, 
networks for the joint doctorates and the industrial doctorates and in a way of uh, in a form of an incentive we will provide uh, an additional opportunity to add up to 180 additional person months to the project the duration of the project will remain 48 months there are no changes from this uh, point of view and the maximum duration for the recruitment of each fellow will remain 36 months um, as now as I mentioned, we have a new uh, aligned rule across actions for the duration of the secondments. In this particular case, secondments out of this third, uh, will be allowed to one third of the total period of actual months spent on the action. In practical terms, out of the 36 months, um, fellows can uh, spend up to one third in secondments um, and time spent in uh, different participants um, within the consortium. The first call, um, doctoral networks call, is expected to open, in fact, in mid-May this year and to close uh, on 16th of November. Please note that these uh, dates are still indicative um, and they, they might be subject to, to uh, change. Uh, but for the time being, the expectation is to open uh, on 18th May. Um, another very important aspect uh, due to the um, high interest um, in our actions uh, and as a measure of uh, demand management in order also to ensure high level, uh, high quality uh, selection of, um, of our projects and to try to improve the success rates of our projects, we'll introduce uh, resubmission restrictions as of uh, 22. Um, which will apply to proposals having received a score below 80% in the previous Horizon Europe call. This is uh, an important novelty, but as I said, important, it will apply only as of 2022, meaning not in the first call of uh, Horizon Europe opening in May this year. Very quickly, um, what is changing in terms of uh, funding modalities as many of you might know um, in our actions we have two main budget categories one is the so-called contributions for the recruited researchers that have to be fully paid to our funded fellows they take the form of a living allowance mobility allowance and if applicable family long-term and special needs allowance and the other uh, category, uh, the institutional unit costs, which are composed by um, contributions to research expenses, training, knowledge uh, uh, sharing and networking on one hand side. And on the other hand side, the management and indirect, call, uh, indirect contributions. It's important to note that um, our actions are not, call, not based on actual costs. They're based on predefined um, amounts. You see them on your screen. These are monthly amounts. Uh, we are operating in an environment of person month basis um, and all these amounts must be multiplied by the months a researcher uh, spends on uh, activities under the action. Um, important uh, here, it's important maybe to, to mention that we have uh, increased the, the amounts for the living allowance and also substantially increased the amount of the family allowance. Um, down um, as a footnote, you would also see um, the predefined rates um, for the special needs allowance uh, for all um, researchers who have a uh, disability. And um, I will quickly move to our um, next action, the postdoctoral fellowships, which is actually um, supporting the individual projects of postdoctoral researchers and uh, help enhance, further enhance the career development of our postdocs. Um, as uh, in the current framework period, uh, we'll remain with uh, two main uh, types of uh, postdoctoral fellowships. These are the European postdoctoral fellowships and the global postdoctoral fellowships. The European ones being about um, researchers of any nationality moving to or within um, uh, Europe. Um, an important change here is that, um, as some of you might know, um, we currently have uh, specific panels, the Career Restart Panel, the Reintegration, the Society Enterprise Panel. Uh, in view of our need to further simplify and streamline our actions, we will no longer have these panels, but 
all this, um, but the, the target groups uh, that they were destined for will uh, actually continue uh, re receiving uh, forms of incentives. You'll see a bit later what I'm talking about. And the global fellowships, uh, which actually allows nationals and long-term long residents of uh, member states and Horizon Europe associated countries to go on a research um, experience uh, in a non-European so-called third country. Um, as I said, these actions target postdoctoral researchers with doctoral degree um, obtained at the call deadline um, and as a new condition under our uh, postdoctoral fellowships we have an additional requirements these postdoctoral researchers must have up to eight years of research experience in full-time equivalence um, measured from the PhD award date um, this is a new condition, uh, but there are also some exceptions to it. Uh, for example, uh, years spent outside research, career breaks, or work outside of Europe for those um, for, for these um, postdoctoral uh, researchers who want to reintegrate to Europe will not count towards this total limit of eight years of research experience. Talking about career breaks, the uh, example of career break could be um, for example, due to maternity or parental leave. Um, and we do, um, in case of maternity leave, uh, there will um, allow um, uh, female researchers to, you, to reduce um, um, 18 months per child uh, born with this period from this uh, total period of eight years of research experience. Another uh, very important uh, change in postdoctoral fellowships is that um, they will actually uh, be open also to proposals who want to, to proposers and to researchers who would like to work in um, domain of research covered by the Eurotom Treaty. This is, in in simple words, the nuclear research fields. This is a big change. So in the future, in the next pro program period, also nuclear research proposals will be uh, funded by by our action. Um, the same principle in uh, in terms of um, applications for this action apply. We need a single legal entity establishing a EU member state or Horizon Europe associated country. The proposal is prepared, however, jointly between the institution and um, uh, the researcher. The same principle uh, in terms of number of proposals per researcher uh, remains. Only one proposal per individual researcher per call uh, will be allowed. Uh, very quickly, a few words about the duration of the action, um, the second ones and the first calls. Um, the European postdoctoral fellowships will remain limited to 24 months. The global postdoctoral fellowships will also remain limited to up to 36 months with a compulsory uh, mandatory phase of um, one year and up to two years outgoing phase in a third country. So no changes from this uh, in this respect. A big novelty for this action is, is the introduction of an optional additional placement period of up to six months in the non-academic uh, uh, sector. Again, uh, non-academic sector for us means industry, SMEs, but also civil society organizations, uh, some museums, um, um, etc. So this placement must be uh, must take place at the very end of the fellowship and in a host in a European member state or Horizon Europe associated country. These are optional placements. In other words, uh, re researchers could opt to have them or not. Um, the usual optional secondments, which every single uh, postdoctoral fellowship uh, has, um, will be limited to, to one third of the standard fellowship duration, or in the case of global postdoctoral fellowships of the outgoing phase. The big novelty here is that um, these secondments can be worldwide, as some of you might know. The current rule is that these secondments take place only in Europe. The big novelty under the next framework period is that uh, secondments could take place also um, outside of Europe. This is a big uh, change and an important possibility for all institutions for, in Latin America and the Caribbean uh, to actually manage to attract talent um, and host these researchers for optional secondments. 
In terms of uh, calls, um, I've highlighted again the first call, the 2021 call, which is expected to open on the 18th of May. The exact date is still uh, subject to internal approval and might be subject to changes. And um, the closure date is expected to be 15th of September. As in the doctoral networks uh, action, uh, we will introduce resubmission restrictions as of 2022. Uh, here, the resubmission restrictions uh, will actually target proposals with the same host and the same researchers with or the same researcher concern, which have received a score below 70% in the previous Horizon Europe call. Again, this is a measure uh, which will help us maintain the high quality of evaluations and will help improve the success rate um, of this action in view of the very uh, competitive uh, nature of the action and the very high interest um, and number of uh, proposals we received in the last years. Again, uh, this will apply only as of 2022. Very quickly uh, here, um, the information about the changes in the funding modalities. Uh, here as well, uh, the living allowance um, will, uh, is uh, substantially increased. Same, the same thing applies to the family allowance. Um, another change, in fact, is that uh, also the research training and networking contributions will uh, be increased for this action. Again, the same principle uh, applies. Uh, we are talking about uh, monthly rates. Um, we are in the person month environment and these rates will be multiplied by the um, actually the, the exact number of person months the researchers spent on the action. Uh, one thing that uh, I forgot to mention in the doctoral networks um, uh, slide and also uh, fully uh, applicable here for postdoctoral fellowships as well is that the living allowance or the in simple words, uh, main contribution to the salary of the researcher. And uh, the amount that you see on the screen is a gross salary. This amount is also um, uh, corrected with, uh, with what we call country correction coefficient uh, to index and to cater for the standard of living in the country where research the researcher is recruited. And moving on to uh, staff exchanges, um, as many of you might uh, uh, might know, this is our action supporting international RNI uh, collaborations through staff exchanges. Um, this is our most international actions. We are happy to have a um, high uh, level of participations from Latin America and the Caribbean, and we look forward to continuing and building on, on this very successful um, um, very successful uh, and um, results up to now. Um, talking about staff exchanges, it's very important maybe to clarify what do we mean by staff. Uh, in fact, these are um, members and personnel at any career stage. Um, they must be involved in the RNI activities of the projects, and this could be doctoral candidates, uh, this could be uh, um, postdoctoral researchers, but also administrative, technical, managerial staff. Um, infrastructure uh, operators and innovators. Uh, the, the important condition here, which remains the same, is that uh, the personnel, the staff members, must be uh, actively engaged or linked uh, to RNI activities for at least one month, full time equivalents, at the sending institution before the first secondment. Um, there is no uh, change of the rules from this point of view, but this is a very important. Um, this is a very important condition that I believe uh, is interesting for all of you to know. Uh, here again, um, the applicants are consortia, consortia of uh, institutions, being them a higher year education establishment, research institution, um, public bodies, businesses, or other uh, socioeconomic actors. They have to come together and establish um, consortium of at least three independent legal entities um, from three different countries. Two of them must be uh, established in a member state or Horizon Europe associated countries. In case the consortium is planning um, to include only participants from the academic sector or uh, participants from only the non-academic sector, then uh, at least one institution from a non-associated third country must be uh, included 
um, in in the in the in the consortium. Beyond these minimum requirements, these are again minimum requirements. Beyond them, any um, uh, institution from any country in the world could join. And in fact, this is what um, or what I already mentioned. This is our most international actions, and we see big consortium with participants from all over the world. The very few words about the size, duration, and first calls of uh, first up exchanges. Um, the new rules will limit the um, size of the staff exchanges to 360 person months. Currently, we have a rule for 540 person months, so the total size will be slightly reduced to 360 person months. However, the project duration will remain the same, 48 months. Um, we remain, we keep the same principles that secondments must be between different countries and they must be between independent entities within these countries. The requirements for the minimum and maximum duration of the, uh, the secondments remain the same, so a minimum of one and a maximum of 12 months per uh, staff member. There is a, one big change, however, in this respect. Um, this minimum and maximum will be independently of uh, the number of organizations the staff is seconded to. As some of you might know currently, uh, for example, for the minimum duration, we always have to take uh, into account uh, the same person and the same uh, staff member going being sent from the same organization and going to the same um, organization so all these three elements were necessary in order to count the minimum and the maximum in the future we'll actually uh, introduce uh, um, uh, make it more easy to comply with the minimum requirements for example a very busy uh, manager research manager would be able uh, to um, comply with the one month um, uh, minimum requirement uh, more easily by joining all um, his or her second months um, to different organizations between uh, within the within the consortium and this will, will be counted towards the minimum requirements. One uh, another change here is um, the uh, is uh, the possibility to actually have uh, interdisciplinary secondments in the same sector. This mainly applies to EU member state and Horizon Europe associated countries. But uh, I put you the rule here because some of you might be actually working for European organizations. The maximum for these interdisciplinary secondments will be one third of the total person months um, actual total person months uh, under the project. Uh, the first call uh, is expected to open in October 2021 and to close in, in March uh, 2022. Uh, very quickly here. Um, Mariana, just to tell that... you, you have one minute left. Thank you. Okay. I'm, I'm finishing. I think I, ha I have two more slides. Um, very quickly here, the top-up allowance is um, increased. For those of you who are familiar with the with our program, we increased by 200 euros the top-up allowance, which must be spent on travel subsistence um, uh, and accommodation costs related to the second month, not on uh, salary of the researcher. And we have a big increase in the research training and networking contribution uh, as well. Very briefly, um, I'll quickly present our last action, the co-fund action, which uh, actually uh, funds newer existing national, regional and international schemes for, um, in fact, for doctoral and postdoctoral uh, uh, fellowships. Um, this action is actually a mono beneficiary action, requires one single legal entity established in a member state and Horizon Europe uh, associated country. So from this point of view, the action is more interested more interesting for researchers from Latin America and the Caribbean and not that um, that much for institutions from the region. Uh, you will quickly see um, um, the novelty here, one third again well, for the second months, no change in terms of duration of the actions and uh, the first call is expected to open on 12 October 2021. Briefly, just for those of you interested, uh, these are the new rates. The novelty here is that the new co-fund allowance can be used in a flexible way, not only to contribute to the researcher's remuneration, but also to contribute to any other cost category related to the doctoral or postdoctoral program. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, wish you all the best, and I will remain here available for any questions you might have. 
Thank you. There, Boriana, thank you so much for this uh, very informative and useful presentation. We have many, many questions from the audience, but as we said at the beginning, we are going to continue with all the panelists, with all the presentations, and then at the end, we will have 15 minutes for uh, the Q&A session. So thank you, thank you again, Boriana, and now we will move to our second presenter, uh, who is Claudia Romano. She is the coordinator of the network of national contact points in the LAC region and also a manager at the Uruguayan Agency for International Cooperation. She will briefly talk about the MSCA national contact points here in the region of Latin America and the Caribbean. Claudia, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Charlotte, for this very important meeting because we consider that it's very important for all the select countries specifically. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that all the Latin American and the Caribbean countries have the possibility to support your action with uh, the different liaison office that are in different countries. You have a very important uh, partner, for example, in Argentina, with the team of the Secretary of the, Gober the Gobierno de Ciencia y Tecnología with Alejandra Davisiu. And then, for example, in, with, uh, in Colombia, with Nicolás Díaz, or in Costa Rica, with different NCP that you can find in all, all the CELA countries. What are the LAC NCP network? LAC NCP network was created in 2018. What are the main objectives? We have uh, the objective to promote and increase the, participa the participation of the different institution in Horizon 2020 and now in the new program Horizon Europe. The second, we improve the participation of Latin American and Caribbean countries in, the, uh, in the, this program. Uh, what are the main functions? Uh, as you can know, in Latin America and CELAC, all, all the, every country have NCP, especially in Marie Slodowska Curie action. And what we have to do, we have to inform and disseminate the information about the program to assist, advise, and train uh, uh, the public and the private NCP. And uh, we try to contact and cooperate with the, the different service, services that you have. As you know, uh, this is, as you can see, this is the structure uh, today with the national contact point in the, the 22 areas. And in the new Horizon 2020, we will have 17 areas, but specifically in Marie Curie Action, we will have, we have, and we will have in the new program, a specific national contact point. How all the researchers that are in this conference, can you, uh, can you um, search or know what are the NCP in your country, please? go to the funding and tenders and uh, look in, in third partner uh, and, and try to know there uh, the NCP in your country. We, we made different kind of training, especially, especially in Spanish, trying to, to share the information in all the university or enterprise on the different institution. You can see there uh, the training that we made with the Red Clara, as you know, in Latin America is the, the biggest network that connect the different university in our country. And specific, we work together with the liaison office in different countries like, uh, like Argentina, Chile, Peru, trying to, to be more in contact with the researcher. What kind of activity, uh, our main activities, and to try to share calls and funding opportunity, uh, we have a LinkedIn group that all of you can join with us 
we made some training activities, especially in Spanish. Uh, by the NCP specific in any country, we try to give assistance to all the research. We have a lot of da uh, online database, and we have a newsletter. We share different kind of information and tips to present uh, our your um, your submit to try to get in contact with other colleagues in Latin America and in Europe and uh, try to promote the the research some some in some case with the support uh, of Euraccess but in other and different meeting uh, working together with Euraccess of course but with the liaison office trying to promote the participation of CELA countries or LA countries that is very important. And we have a support material specific uh, in Spanish, one about Horizon uh, Europe or Horizon 2020 and, and two for institution and for research uh, in Latin American and Caribbean uh, with step by step how to be in contact with host institution, how to be in contact with what are the specific opportunity that all the CELA country have or the researcher. Uh, we will share with us some information about the different network in different areas that we can, uh, you can find some partner or some information specific uh, network that we can share with you is the program that called Net for Mobility Plus that in, in this uh, opportunity will, uh, could be very important for, for you to be in contact with, with others. That's all, that's our contact, that's our address, our uh, mail, and thank you very much. Uh, we will uh, answer the question by email or in the in the communication. Thank you very much, Victoria. Muchas gracias, Claudia. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was very brief, but very, very important, especially for our researchers and institutions here in the LAC region. Last but not least, we will hear from my colleague Charlotte Gravitz, who is one of the two regional coordinators of Euraxis Latin America and the Caribbean based in Brazil. Charlotte is responsible mainly for Brazil, Argentina and Chile. Now she will briefly present what can Euraxis do for you. Charlotte, the floor is yours. Thank you, Victoria. Hello, everybody. The objective of my presentation is indeed to show how your access can support researchers interested in a stay in Europe. So, you know, my name is Charlotte and together with Victoria, we represent your access in Latin America and the Caribbean. Your access is a European Commission initiative to support the mobility of researchers and their career development. How do we support you? providing information and support services. And I will detail them in a minute, but it's also important to say what we don't do. Your access doesn't fund mobility. We heard from Boriana now how the European Commission funds mobility and training with the MSCA program, but it also, the commissioner also has other um, funding opportunities through the European Research Council, the ERC, or other Horizon Europe calls. Well, let me show you what can your access do for you. To support uh, researchers in their mobility project, your access offers five main tools that are accessible from the main portal that you see on your screen. When a scientist is considering a research stay in Europe, he or she, you need a job. That's why our first portal is called Your Access Jobs. It's an online free of charge database offering career opportunities. In this section, you will find job offers all related to science in Europe mainly, but also worldwide. This is on this portal that you can also find the PhD positions offered by um, MSCA. 
In this portal, you can also find funding opportunities, scholarship grants by the European Commission, but also by member states to support your mobility. You will also find hosting offers from institutions that want to receive visiting researchers, for example, under the MSCA call for postdoctoral fellowships. You can also count on your access to test your abilities and find online training in the career development module. We can also help you finding partners. For example, if you are looking for partners, uh, institution or individuals to apply for funding, for example, the staff exchange call. Well, when you are ready to cross the ocean for a research stay in Europe, you can count on the support of our colleagues in Europe from the Euraxis Information and Assistance. They help researchers and their families organizing their relocation and arrival in a new country. There are more than 500 centers, Euraxis offices across 42 European countries. So they deal with a variety of topics such as visa, housing, social security, etc. Each one of these countries has its own Euraxis portal that you can access directly from the homepage. Last but not least, Euraxis Worldwide is the international arm of Euraxis where you can find us, Euraxis Brazil and LAC. And I will tell you more about our activities in a second, but let me stress that uh, to use all the functionalities of Euraxis, you can create an account for free and then you'll be able to publish your CV, but also to create alerts. So you receive notifications when a job matches your profile. You will be able to look for partners and even to advertise the job positions in your institutions. Well, in the region, in Latin America and the Caribbean, we um, support you, we, we send us you uh, updated information which are relevant to researchers interested in mobility or international collaboration. We disseminate open calls, events, opportunities in Europe. Most important, I would say we help you understand EU funding and we provide training and useful resources. But we also support you developing your skills. For example, we are now offering a series of five webinars on scientific publishing, and it will start on the 25th of March next week. All these usually in Portuguese or in Spanish. Well, I invite you to register in our mailing list and follow us on Facebook and Twitter to stay updated on our activities. And so you don't miss any of the mobility opportunities that we identify for you. Do not hesitate to contact us too. If you want, we are at your disposal to support your mobility projects. Thank you very much, Charlotte, for your presentation and um, sharing with us what can your access, especially your access luck, do for the researchers here in the region. Now we have finished with all the presentations this morning, and we are going to continue with the Q&A session as indicated in the agenda. We are going to have approximately 15 minutes for the Q&A, so hopefully we'll be able to answer all your questions that you have been asking. So let me um, address um, the very first two, three questions to Boriana, because there are a lot, but we will try to cluster them, uh, because many of you uh, were asking about the age limit. If there are any age limits for the doctoral and the, the postdoctoral fellowships. Boriana, if you could clarify, please. Yes, yeah, starting from the doctoral candidates, um, uh, there are no limitations or restrictions in terms of age. Uh, so the only condition is that these researchers should not have a doctoral degree at the date of recruitment. Um, as um, uh, Charlotte and uh, also Vicky mentioned, um, the vacancies for the doctoral networks and the uh, co-fund MSCA actions are published on the Your Access portal. So there you see more, um, because I saw that in the, the chat box there were also questions about other conditions. So you will see the, the published vacancies for all um, uh, uh, for 
currently available for all funded doctoral networks on the your access portal where you will actually be able to see what's currently on offer and actually prepare your proposal and directly apply to the institution so at the level of the researcher for the doctoral networks and co-fund uh, doctoral level training um, uh, actions the applications from individuals is actually directly to the institution who will later on recruit you it's not uh, an application um, intended for for uh, the European Commission or the research executive agency which manages the MSCA actions. And moving to the um, uh, question for the postdoctoral researchers, in fact, uh, we, we should not talk about uh, uh, age um, in the, let's say, strict and literal sense of the word. We are rather talking about years of research experience. Uh, postdoctoral researchers must have up to eight years of research experience. And as I said, we have some exceptions from this minimum. Um, for example, um, uh, periods of career breaks or periods where the researcher was actually working out Outside of research, completely changed job, and for example, took a very interesting professional opportunity in, a, in a not related to research. And as I mentioned, all these career breaks related to maternity, parental leave, and so on. So we are not talking about age in the um, strict sense of uh, of this word, but rather of years of research experience. So I hope this uh, clarifies uh, the doubts raised. Thank you very much, Boriana. So is it the same as it was under the um, Horizon 2020 program that the minimum requirement is either having a PhD or at least four years of research experience at the deadline of the call? Uh, so for postdoctoral researchers, indeed, the cutoff event and let's say the important date is really the call deadline. The big uh, uh, difference is that now uh, we change the definition of postdoctoral researchers. So for us, postdoctoral researchers will be the ones with the po uh, a doctoral degree, with the PhD. Uh, and we no longer allow for this uh, four years of full-time research uh, experience, meaning that all of our researchers must have a PhD at the call deadline, at the postdoctoral fellowships call deadline which is actually launched by the research executive agency so uh, this is a slight change in the new rule in this respect thank you so much which we assume uh, shall be in september this year indeed indeed the current uh, date is mid-september um, indicative because yes. it might be subject to a change but for the time being it's mid-september the call deadline. perfect yes, indeed. thank you so much uh, another big elephant in the room, and I'm sure that you um, were expecting this question, uh, are actually the associated countries to Horizon Europe and whether it will be applicable to especially uh, our attendees are asking to do uh, a postdoc in Switzerland or in the UK. If you can say a few words about that, please. Yeah, indeed. So for the time being, no association agreements were signed, uh, but we have indications that many of the currently uh, the 16 associated countries to the program will actually continue or have interest to be associated again to the Horizon Europe uh, uh, program. Uh, in in the particular case of Switzerland, this will be, of course, uh, subject to internal approval decision uh, for proceeding with the association. And in the case of uh, the UK, because I believe that many of you are indeed uh, interested in this, um, in the terms um, are, um, agreed after the withdrawal agreement, um, actually the UK has signaled interest to become associated country to Horizon Europe. Of course, uh, this will be subject to official um, signature of the, um, of the association agreements, but our indications that uh, are that both countries will, uh, will join at a later stage um, and become associated to the program. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question for you, Boriana, whether um, the English is required for writing the proposals and whether there is an um, official standard requirement of the English proficiency or language in order to apply. Um, in line with um, the EU policies for uh, cultural diversity and um, uh, supporting different diversity also in terms of languages, uh, applicants are, uh, of course, free to submit proposals in other languages uh, uh, as such. But for the evaluation purposes, and because we do rely on independent evaluators, the, um, we, we encourage uh, um, 
proposals to be submitted in English because this proposal will be given in, in the original form to the evaluator. Of course, our evaluators come from all over the world, um, but the main language that uh, they dominate is English. So from this point of view, if the proposal is not uh, uh, in English, it's let's say uh, in Spanish, um, the, um, there might be differences between the translation uh, and which might affect a bit uh, the quality of the proposal. So that's why we encourage, of course, uh, that this is prepared in English, but applicants are free to submit um, in other languages. Thank you so much. Um, there, there was also a question and I will briefly uh, answer it. Uh, which concerns some of the abbreviations that we have been using or you have been using on your slides. Um, MS stands for the EU member state, so the 27 member states of the European Union. HE stands for Horizon Europe, so the new uh, research and innovation program of the European Union. And the AC stands for the associated countries to Horizon Europe, uh, exactly the group of countries that Boriana just mentioned, um, that the so-called association agreements have not been finalized and signed yet, but all fingers crossed that it will happen um, very, very soon. Uh, there is another question. Uh, Danielle is asking, will you outline today the possibilities of joint research projects between institutions in Europe and other continents? Um, so basically in one of the breakout rooms uh, that will follow uh, in a minute, we are going to talk about um, these research uh, possibilities, uh, research projects uh, between Latin America and Europe, um, especially under the action called RISE. Uh, so please be a little bit patient. We will we'll definitely talk about that. Um, there is also a question if um, there are any fellowships to obtain a master degree. Uh, or can we apply for the PhD fellowship and uh, earn our master along the way? Um, I don't know, Boriana, if you could uh, perhaps comment on, on this one. Yeah, sure. So uh, the doctoral networks and the uh, doctoral programs under the co-fund actions are really targeting doctoral candidates without uh, a PhD degree. However, in many countries, there is a requirement and actually there is a gradual step from a master's degree, you, you can move to a doctoral degree. In some countries, uh, from, from what I recall, in the uh, this might be UK, where there is no um, requirement to obtain first a master and then move directly to a doctoral degree. So in some countries, this might be uh, possible. However, um, the usual uh, career path is clear in many of the countries. Usually um, there is a requirement. You cannot become uh, and obtain a doctoral degree if you don't have a master's degree first. And this is the usual, uh, the usual requirements in many countries. But again, there might be exceptions. And I believe that this is the UK. Um, another thing that might be interested, uh, interesting to mention here is that, uh, in fact, um, in under the staff exchanges action, uh, the one actually um, uh, targeting short term exchanges between institutions consortia in uh, in, um, in a big network and working together on RNI activities. Actually, um, as I said, staff member, um, the staff member definition is very broad in the sense that uh, could also cover, of course, doctoral uh, candidates, researchers, but also administrative technical staff, uh, managerial staff, meaning uh, individuals without a PhD degree. So from this point of view, master's degree students could be actually sent on short-term secondments under the staff exchanges section. So um, if you are at this career stage, um, I would uh, advise you to look for opportunities under this section. Thank you so much. Um, now, obviously, we have changed a little bit the eligibility criteria uh, for uh, some of the actions uh, compared to Horizon 2020. Um, so there are a few attendees that are asking if there are any other possibilities within the MSCA for funding postdoctoral candidates uh, with more than eight years of experience after their PhD. Yes, in fact, uh, this um, eight years uh, research experience limit does not apply to, to co-fund, to the co-fund postdoctoral program. So um, this will be possible under the co-fund uh, action. And once again, with regard to the staff exchanges, uh, the short-term exchanges that I mentioned, uh, 
short term in the sense minimum one month and maximum 12 months per, per postdoctoral researcher uh, could happen. So um, yes, if you have more than eight years of research experience, I would recommend you to rather focus on staff exchanges or co-fund postdoctoral programs. Thank you so much. Um, we have time for two more questions. Um, and uh, one is still going to go towards you, Boriana. We are very happy to have you with us uh, as an expert. So we'll, we'll try to squeeze as much out as possible. Um, another question for you is whether there are any criteria for the resubmission of uh, the proposals, I believe, uh, especially for the PF, for the postdoctoral fellowships. Yes, so the conditions um, that I mentioned are um, a minimum uh, score received in the previous Horizon Europe calls. So uh, this won't apply. I saw that there was one question actually uh, related to um, uh, possible, would this would it be possible to resubmit a Horizon 2020 proposal in the first Horizon Europe call? That will be possible. So the restrictions will apply only as of 2022 and for uh, towards the first 2021 Horizon Europe postdoc fellowship call and uh, the the requirements uh, and, and the nature of these resubmission restrictions in the postdoctoral fellowship call will be again uh, so a, a score and uh, the proposal should not have received um, um, less than 80 um, percent of a score and also the proposals must include the same uh, recruiting institution and the same researcher in the sense that if uh, should the researcher change uh, institution and from this point of view of course the whole proposal will change because of course with the new institution um, uh, the objectives of the proposal will also substantially change and also the Uh, considered uh, as possible to be resubmitted, submitted actually, because in, fr from our point of view, it will be a, a new proposal. I hope this clarified uh, the doubt. Thank you so much, Boriana. Um, and this question might probably go to both you, Boriana, and maybe Charlotte as well, from our point of view as as coordinators of the Euraxis LAC, uh, whether um, there are any lists of potential host institutions in Europe. Boriana, if you want to answer, but I think I'll, I'll you... just, uh, yeah. I'll just start by saying that um, um, Claudia mentioned the Net for Mobility Plus uh, website. Um, this is the network uh, for our national contact points, which are based in Europe and uh, beyond. In Latin America, we have uh, very good national contact points, so please do not hesitate to contact them uh, for li liaising with our um, European partners. But also on this uh, Net for Mobility Plus website, you have um, a tab called Expression of Interest, where you could see actually actually um, different institution expressing interest in participating in Maris Kudowska Curie actions. Um, um, so this will be a source of information. I believe that also the Euraxis page offers uh, such, a, such an option, but Charlotte, uh, I give you the floor for this. Exactly. Thank you, Boriana. On, on the Euraxis portal, um, job, job portal, you can find a list of institutions who volunteered to hosting postdoctoral fellows under the MSCA call. But um, at large, all institutions are willing to host uh, fellows, right? So this is an indicative list. And this is also something that you can use from Latin America and the Caribbean if you want to host visiting researchers from Europe because um, you have this possibility. So it's a way for you to increase your visibility and we really encourage you to use this partner, this um, hosting um, offer tool. A big thank you to all the speakers and attendees. Unfortunately, we don't have more time for the Q&A session. So all your questions that you have been asking and have not been answered yet, please do let us know. Send us an email to laclacatyouraccess.net and we will try to answer your pending questions. We also hope that you're taking a lot of important messages home with you and will consider applying for one of the Marie Curie actions this year or maybe in the future. 
please stay with us a little bit longer and learn from the personal stories of researchers who have already received one of the Marie Curie fellowships. Now that we have concluded the plenary session, we will move to the breakout mm -hmm. rooms. There are four of them with a duration of approximately 30 minutes. You shall choose one room based on your interest. So we are not going to divide you into the rooms, but you have to choose um, the room that you are the most interested in, the topic that you are most interested in. So let me tell you the differences between the four rooms and what they will cover very quickly. Room one will cover the PhD fellowships in Europe and is mainly dedicated to those who don't have a PhD yet and want to learn more about this opportunity. Room two will cover postdoctoral fellowships and is aimed mainly at those who want to do a postdoc in Europe. Room three is entitled Research and Innovation Projects and will cover collaborative projects and short-term mobility. Room four is called Doctoral Training Networks Experience of Luck Institutions. This session is dedicated to your institution, be it private or public, that wants to join forces with European and international institutions to offer a doctoral training. So this is not for individual researchers, but it is for institutions, be it your university, a laboratory, an SME, a startup, etc.